These videos were created by WSC Sports AI Automation. WSC Sports Automated Video Solutions lets you create any kind of sports content automatically and in real time to scale and innovate video delivery with infinite options. Join the leading sports organizations worldwide and supercharge your brand. WSC Sports, it's automagical. Wow, Soccer X, 25th anniversary. My goodness, that is incredible. Where has that gone? And what a fantastic company it is to be involved in. Being ambassador for all those years, meeting some great people, big companies, big businesses, and my goodness, people from all walks of life, UEFA, FIFA, it is quite astonishing. And it's been such a wonderful company to be involved in. SoccerX, it has been special. Hi everybody, this is Phil Lynch from Manchester United. Just wanted to create a quick video to wish Soccer X a happy 25th birthday anniversary and to thank them for all the hard work and support over the past several years. Looking forward to 25 more. Thanks a lot and enjoy it. Congratulations.
happy 25th anniversary, Soccer X. Congratulations. I was at your very first event back in 96. And I'm still going to them. I think it was the first event where Duncan wrote me in to uh, build your very first website. And here we are now, my new business, uh, providing you with, with football data. It's been a pleasure working with you over these years. You are the, the pinnacle in the world of football conferences uh, and conventions. Um, and listen, all the very, very best for the next 25 years as well. Cheers. Hi Rayton and everybody at Soccer X. Congratulations on your 25th anniversary. What a great idea it was years ago when Duncan came up with this uh, exhibition. It was brilliant to support it. What a great man, uh, what a fantastic character. Uh, love and kisses to everybody. Congratulations, Soccer X, for the 25 years of service performed to sports, especially throughout football. My relationship with Soccer X transcends its wonderful events. I feel part of this family. Long live, Soccer X. I love you all.
Família Soccer X, parabéns pelo 25º aniversário. Do fundo do meu coração, que vocês sejam sempre muito felizes fazendo os eventos ao redor do mundo. Soccer X, que é o maior evento esportivo do planeta. E eu que sempre tenho a honra de estar presente em qualquer canto do planeta, aprendendo bastante e compartilhando conhecimento com todos vocês. Parabéns, felicidades e contem sempre comigo.
Hello and welcome back to Socrates Connected 100. On our 100th out of 100 days, uh, we have a couple of sessions here closing out what's been a marathon event um, and one right now which is extremely interesting. Uh, brought to you by our friends at WSC Sports, the role of AI in media production. Taking us through it, it's Ty Epstein, Head of Business Development at WSC Sports and Michael Sutherland, Chief Transformation Officer at Real Madrid. Gentlemen, over to you. Thanks so much. Hi, Michael. How are you? Great, great. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to be here at this uh, Soccer X event. Yeah, thanks for joining me for the session. Um, so, yes, we're going to talk about uh, the role of AI in media production. Thanks, everybody, whoever joined us. I uh, hope you're going to uh, enjoy this session. Um, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, we'll be discussing about how sports brands and organizations can utilize AI technology to support their content strategy, streamline and automate media production, increase reach and engagement through personalization and localization of content to drive user acquisition, create new commercial opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, all the right buzzwords that you wanna hear. Um, and uh, I think that Michael is basically the, the perfect uh, person to talk about all these topics with. Um, so Michael, let's start with something um, I think that uh, very impressive. Uh, Real Madrid recently reached an amazing milestone of 100 million followers on Instagram. Um, I think you're the first club in the world to do such thing. So I'm interested uh, to know, like, as clubs have quite restricted media rights, um, and most of the content is provided by uh, to your fans by, you know, mediators, the rights holders, uh, uh, I think mainly. How do you manage to be so successful in engaging fans despite these limited rights? Uh, which platforms do you use? Which types of content do you produce on each platform? And in general, what are your objectives in each of the platforms that you have on the digital space? Great. Well, that's a great question to start with. Thanks, thanks, uh, Itai. So, um, just I mean, just to to start with on that, that hundred million milestone. I mean, it's it's an interesting one to just reflect on because, uh, of course, it's really the result of of uh, many, many years of growth and development, and development of the strategy, development of the way that we as a club um, approach social media. But it just that that particular milestone is, is an interesting one, because as you said, um, Real Madrid is, does have the, um, the good fortune of being the first uh, sports team to, to achieve that milestone. But more broadly, it's um, we're actually the third brand globally to achieve that milestone. And I think it, when you look at it in that context, it gives you a bit of a sense of the scale that uh, sports teams are really operating at in terms of the reach around media and the, and the, um, the type of content that needs to be produced. So to, to manage a, an audience and a, and a community of fans um, of you know, this, this number of fans, I mean, it really requires the ability to... Um, manage media production at scale. But in the world of football, we're also having to run a fairly lean operation. So we're having to produce more content, uh, engage more fans, but we're always, always having to do it with limited and constrained resources. And, and uh, you know, if we, if we start to look at the topic of this um, conversation about the role of AI, I think that really gets into the heart of where AI is going to be bringing a huge amount of uh, value into uh, sports teams and, and other other uh, brands that are in a similar, similar situation. You know, to go to, to go to your sort of second point there about the the limited rights. Now, this is um, obviously a, a a challenge that that we face, but it's a challenge that that most sports teams face. Um, you know, when you're talking about that, I guess you're mainly referring to the fact that we don't have the rights to stream the actual football match, and so. That does introduce um, some challenges, but it's not a challenge that we face uniquely. It's a challenge that's faced by every sports team. And so right. what it does is it means that we have to think more creatively. We have to think around the event and we have to think even more broadly than just the event. You know, how do we create content that serves our fans on a 24-7, 365 day basis? Yeah, and, and it's not only the live games, right? Also, when we talk about even highlights or short form content, the rights are quite restricted there as well. So if we look at your platforms, whether it's social media, Real Madrid TV, website, app, so what are your objectives or what kind, what types of content you produce in each and every one of them? And maybe you utilize other content from other teams you have at Real Madrid rather than just the first football team. Like what kind of content you use on all these platforms? Yeah, so the, I think there's two two parts to that, right? So one is really how do we produce content for the different platforms and how we select the content that we produce? 
And the other part is, you know, we're more than just a football team. Um, we have uh, we have a professional women's football team. We also have basketball team. And so we have to think about producing content for all of our fans across all of our sports um, teams. And that's obviously not just at the professional level, but we also go into the academies as well. So um, on the on that first part uh, around, you know, how do we produce content for the dis- different social social channels and, and not just social channels, but other channels, we manage a, a linear t- television channel and we also do direct uh, content through our digital channels. Um, I mean, the, the philosophy that we, and I would say most, um, most brands really uh, try to adopt at least the best they can is really to obviously cater content per channel and really customize that content to the channel and to the audience that you're trying to engage on that channel. And each channel is different and each channel has different content needs. And so in order to do that, in a perfect world, we would produce a different piece of content for every single channel, every single uh, every single opportunity. But of course, uh, we're not in a perfect world. And as I mentioned before, we have limited constraints. So we, we have to be smart about how we create content that feels native for each channel, uh, but also do that in a way that allows us to scale it up and leverage the content that we have in the most effective way. And so we're thinking about the you know the format of that content in terms of whether it's one one or you know we're doing 169 ratio it has to be about is it long form short form what's the tone that we're trying to create uh in the audience that we're trying to engage different demographics across different channels so there's a lot of different variables that we have to think about when we're producing content and we're always thinking about the audience uh, that we're trying to serve uh for each of those channels so, you know, for, um, for a club like Real Madrid, like I ma- mentioned, um, we, you know, we, we want to deliver the best content we can across all of our sports teams. Um, but of course, you know, we have to put focus in some areas. And so this is another area that we're looking towards uh, tools that leverage AI to help us scale up that production. And ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to produce better quality content, more content, and do it at a cheaper cost. So, you know, we, we don't want to sacrifice quality, but we want to scale up production and we need to do it on a budget as all of our all of the other sports teams are having to do and all of the other uh, brands in the world are having to do as well. Right, well, amen to that. And uh, hopefully WSC will be helpful to achieve uh, these objectives. Um, as you know, uh, we just uh, started collaborating together um, and we are also focusing on women, Castilla basketball alongside the first men team. So, you know, hopefully uh, we'll manage to, to achieve these goals uh, that you just uh, described. Um, going back to the platforms, you know, clubs OTT, uh, you know it much better than me, is becoming very, very popular, uh, especially among the big brands, big clubs like yourselves, uh, especially for international brands, tier one clubs, but not only. Um, we see also tier two and tier three leagues and clubs today um, launching their own OTT platforms. What's your general vision for your Real Madrid TV? I mean, it's not, maybe if we look like a few years back, it's not natural for a football club to have their own linear channel or a 24-7 OTT channel. Um, what's your general vision for this and how could AI help you promote this vision and your OTT in general? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is to sort of look at why why an OTT because there's sort of an assumption there that it is important. So why is why is an OTT important for a club? And I think this goes to a, a broader shift that's happening in the market, which is um, things like the disappearance of third party cookies. Where more and more you're seeing uh, brands, not just within the sports sector, but more broadly, companies, brands everywhere, in a race to be able to uh, have that direct relationship with their customer. And part of that is because, of course, we always want to deliver the best experience that we can to our fans and companies to their customers, but also because that first party customer data is becoming more and more and more valuable to the organization. And I'm not talking about valuable in the sense that we're going to sell our fan data. I'm not talking about selling data. What I'm talking about is that data allows us to deliver the experience that we we want to deliver and that we are going to need to deliver. And without um, that OTT platform, which is directly serving our audience, Uh, for example, with social media, we don't get that data. And so although social media will continue to be incredibly important, gives us an extensive reach, it gives us the ability to connect with hundreds of millions of fans, what it doesn't really get us, let us do is have that direct relationship with the the fan. And it doesn't allow us to uh, be able to collect that data that allows us to deliver the type of experience that we really want to be able to deliver in the future. 
So OTT is becoming really important strategically from a data and digital strategy standpoint. But on top of that, it lets us deliver a different type of experience than we can deliver through social media. So it delivers a more personalized experience. We can customize the, not just the content that we're delivering, but we can customize it and personalize it on a per fan basis, leveraging AI in, in a myriad of different ways. Um, but on top of that, we can even have a more interactive experience where that experience is actually being determined by the behavior and by the actions that the fans are taking as they engage with our platform. So, you know, I don't think of an OTT as a passive uh, platform. I think of it really as a way that we can create an interactive experience for our fans. And I mean, you're seeing that, you know, those sorts of things are emerging already through social platforms. Um, but now we have the ability, the technologies, the tools uh, to be able to deliver that directly to our fans. And it's becoming and will become a more and more important part of um, the way that we engage fans moving forward. And you're going to see that broadly across the industry. Right. And that's fascinating, but also sounds like a very big challenge. I mean, if you take a club that's supposed to be focused on, you know, playing football, suddenly you're becoming a media company, right? You need to produce content. You need to have a lot of content. You need to have like not only the... The, the people, also all the hardware and everything. Um, like what's, what's your plans towards it? Like, are you planning to also become more and more kind of production oriented or are you planning to engage and partner with companies that are already doing production like different broadcasters around the world? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's important to, to remember, I mean, you, like you say, we're, we're, a, we're a football club. Um, you know, and we don't we don't forget that at, at the heart of what we do is is football is is basketball as well. Um, but if you look back into the to the good old days, you know, when you had a, a smaller club and a smaller fan base, I mean, you could really create an incredible community um, that was very very close to the club and to the point where they they followed every match, they drove around with the team. And unfortunately, we're now at a at a scale where we don't have the luxury of, of delivering that type of uh, small community experience. So what we're having to do is try to do the best, to deliver that type of experience with our fans at scale. And the only way to do that is through the use of technology. And as you say, we have to start thinking of ourselves as more of a media and entertainment company in order to deliver that personalized experience. And so we're, as we think about ourselves in that light, and that's not to say that we become a media and entertainment company. We will still be a football club, right. but we have to look at ourselves with that lens in order to understand how we deliver those experience. And so when we look at you know, other media and entertainment companies, we can look at where the benchmarks are, where the leaders in that industry are going, and we have to be able to be a leader in that industry as well. And so that's why we need to be looking at, at really delivering uh, the cutting edge experience by leveraging new technologies and, and platforms that are coming along to deliver that. Right. And, and when we talk about fan experience, let's talk a little bit about the balance between, you know, the natural existential need to monetize content, you know, and to earn money uh, versus the need to build your brand, be popular, which is much more, uh, I, I assume it's easier to do that when you offer things, services, content for free. What do you think is the right balance between charging money for content and offering content for free in order to, you know, increase engagement and, uh, I don't know, in, become more popular in specific uh, spaces, regions, markets, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. It's, and it's really right at the heart of the model of a, of a sports club. Of course, sponsorship and partnerships are a major, major part of our business. And I think it is easy to get locked into that, uh, that trade-off is that sort of a zero-sum game. Do we go for commercialization or do we go for great content? And I don't really see it in that way. I, I, I really look at it more as an ecosystem and there's value to be created through, throughout that ecosystem. So, you know, in the sense that do our fans want to be blasted with advertisements through our social channels no and that's why we don't do that so we if you look at our social channels we do produce commercial content we do produce co-branded content but we don't uh, we we specifically uh, focus on uh, maintaining engagement and so we want to always make sure that we're delivering a great experience now where i say that this is an ecosystem and i don't think it's a trade-off is if you look at it purely as commercial content versus non-commercial content 
you're sort of missing the opportunity there, which is about creating great content that serves the interests of our fans and our partners. And that's really where the industry is moving to. And that has the added benefit of delivering 100% great content, but also allowing us to utilize more of that digital inventory for so-called commercial content. So the, the shift that's happening right now is moving from here's a commercial piece to here's a great piece of content, here's a great storyline, here's a great series that we can create. And we think that this is a perfect series to bring some of our partners in and we can bring them in different ways. They could be a, a title sponsor, they could be a, an embedded sponsor, they could be a really part of the narrative of that content. And if we're doing that in a way that first of all creates great storytelling, great content, great engagement, then everyone is winning and there isn't that trade-off between commercial versus engagement. Right. And so I think most of the, the examples that you gave are around um, sponsoring content. Is there, are there any models that you're applying uh, that are more based on putting content behind a paywall? Um, is it something that you believe in? Well, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's, a good, that's a good question in the sense that um, are we going to put content behind a paywall? Uh, now, paywalls to me sound very negative, right? You, who wants to be behind a, a wall or, or facing <laughs> a wall? So yeah. when we think about paywalls, what I'm really thinking about is can we create a great product that people want to pay for? So that's the way that we would approach it. So in the sense of, you know, are we going to have a subscription for an OTT? Well, the question would be, can we deliver enough value that we feel that fans uh, feel it's worth paying for that content? And by paying for that content, they're getting more than they would have otherwise. And is there a fair exchange of value happening there? And so in that sense, I think that there, uh, you know, we've seen different uh, models be tried in the industry where a pure subscription model for OTT and it, it's had various levels of success, I think. Um, the reality is you need to provide a lot of value to your fans these days. And so we're looking often at more holistic models, um, but we're also looking at many different types of models. So it could be that it's a subscription or it could be that it's a microtransaction or pay-per-view. There's many different models and we're, you know, the best way is to really experiment with, with them. But at the same time, it's always about, do we have the right exchange of value for our fans that they feel that they're getting their money's worth? Because in a subscription, it's, it's very easy to try and get someone to sign up to that first year or that first month. But that renewal in that second month, that second year is where you really need to be focusing your attention. Because if you can't get that renewal, it's not really going to become a sustainable business. And it really ultimately means that you're not delivering enough value to, to justify that. And, you know, and the reality is that, that football clubs because we have these passionate fan bases, you know, we have a responsibility as well because in the nature of being a fan, there is a, there is a desire to want to support your club. And we have to be careful because we can put out products that people will pay for just to support the club. But I think it's important for us that we provide products that are valuable to our fans and that we're really delivering value. So that, that's the approach that we typically take in terms of how do we want to um, you know, create a payment uh, model around it, create a business model around it. And often we're looking at how do we bring more value across our entire ecosystem as opposed to looking at individual silos of the business. Right. No, I totally relate. Um, let's talk a little bit more about personalizing content. So, you know, I think that according to all recent consumption trends and different research of sports media, it seems like short form content is becoming more and more important, popular and relevant. And the need for content personalization and localization across different markets, especially for an international brand like yourselves, in order to engage better with fans. So this need is increasing over years, um, especially among younger generations, right? Can you relate to this trend in general, or maybe you see things differently? And what do you do at Real Madrid uh, to address these trends, to give fans more personalized, localized content, more short form content, and I know maybe we can talk also more specifically about engaging younger generations. Absolutely. I mean, I think what it comes down to is sort of frequency of engagement. And of course, what we're living in is a, is a very noisy, very busy world. And, and although we have an incredible fan base that supports the club on a daily basis, the reality is that they live busy lives as well. And they have plenty of other things that occupy their attention. So, you know, 
every brand is, is fighting for uh, relevancy. And of course, you need to be able to deliver valuable content if that's the way that you're looking to engage fans. So of course, in that world, uh, short form content is becoming more and more prevalent, more and more valuable. But we always balance that with longer form content because certain platforms like YouTube, for example, typically are going to work better with longer form content. Of course, you've got platforms like TikTok, which are predominantly only very, very short form content. You know, as we go more and more into delivering content directly throughout and operated channels, um, there is always that balance. And often the balance comes in, you know, short form is something that is really built around engagement and frequency of engagement. And that longer form content can often be the more premium, uh, you know, more with more investment going into that content. But ultimately, that's where we need to start, you know, being very smart about how we go about producing that content. Because the more content we have to produce, obviously, the more people we would naturally need, the more budget we're going to need. And this is really where the role of AI comes in. So, you know, we're really looking, I mean, AI generally is something that we are broadly looking at applying across the business. Um, AI is, you mentioned at the beginning about buzzwords, but AI is still, I think, has a little bit of a stigma to being associated with being a buzzword, but it's really beyond that now. AI is something that is here. It is the future. It's going to be broadly deployed across all aspects of the business. And so as we look to how we establish our, um, our continued sort of leadership going forward, we're looking at, at how we're applying AI in every as aspect of the business. And in the case of media production, um, what it allows us to do is it allows us to replace a lot of the manual work. So, um, which in some cases could actually be a job. And this is where, you know, you often get these conversations about AI is going to take away jobs. And in some, in some ways, that's what we're looking to have happen, but not to replace the person, to replace the job. Because that person now can focus their attention on more creative content, or they can focus their attention on driving the AI tools to create more use cases and more content out of that. So that one person, even though the role disappeared, their job is now increased substantially because they now have tools that are able to, that they're able to produce better quality content and more content. And that's uh, a fundamental part of where we're using AI in, in media production. Exactly. And I totally agree. What we always say at WSC is that we don't replace people, we empower people because we enable them to focus more on things that, you know, the machine cannot do. Uh, the more interesting things, the background stories, documentaries, you know, the more uh, kind of high quality content that you mentioned earlier, that you need the balance between the short form content that can be automated today with the long form content, which you know, you, you really need this touch by, you know, the, the, the person that actually knows uh, the, the context and the, to tell the story of whatever you want to you want to do there. That is not just a game highlight, it's not just the footage. Um, so I totally agree. Um, and I would say that in general, we at WSC, when we talk about content personalization, when we talk about scale up content production to enable you to create large variety of content, but also localized content to different markets. So you can actually create customized content packages for fans around the world. So your Spanish fans would see one thing and your French fans and African fans, Chinese fans, uh, whatever, each and every one of them will see what they want to see. So when you talk about localizing content around the world and you talk about utilizing AI, do you have segmentations today that enable you to say, we know that our fans in specific parts of the world um, are, will be more engaged with specific kind of content and we should give them more of that? Yeah, so I mean, this is where you start getting into the many, many, many different roles that AI can play in media production. So, I mean, one of the ones that we've just talked about is obviously the automation of uh, content production. Um, but then that goes into automation and then also programmatic automation, which are two slightly different things. Um, and just to, just to sort of go through the nuances, they're quite an interesting nuance. The automatic production allows us to, of course, uh, for things that are, that are recurring, uh, could be for match highlights or it could be for best goals, um, we can now automate a lot of that production. And that's fantastic. But when we get to programmatic production, now we can actually personalize the delivery of those pieces of content. So instead of just saying we're going to produce uh, match highlights, now we could put some variables in there and we can say, okay, for this segment, we're going to produce highlights in this way. For this segment, we're going to produce highlights in this way. 
we can mix and match. We can mix uh, maybe different players that we know are more appealing to these segments. So, you know, this is where we start to see AI playing a role in a whole lot of different ways. Now, going beyond that, you just mentioned segmentation. We can also use AI to do more intelligent segmentation. So instead of, uh, instead of just looking at it from sort of an analytics standpoint, we can use new you know, different techniques. We could use unsupervised learning, for example, to automatically create segments based on properties that are uh, in, in sort of emergent in the data or inherent in the data that we can't even see at the surface. So that's allowing us to deliver a much more personalized experience, both at a segment level and being able to deliver more refined segments. But ultimately, the most refined segment is a segment of one. And so, you know, that is when we start to get into delivering fully personalized experience. So whether that's delivering it through our website, so we might have, uh, when you go and visit our website, perhaps you're going to see a piece of content that is specifically being selected for you because you're matching the profile of perhaps, a, a, perhaps one of these segments, but you're getting an experience that's personalized. Or in the case of an OTT, we're actually customizing it directly for your profile based on your own behavior and not even based uh, on, a, on a segment, but really based on your own past historical um, preferences. So, you know, it really starts to come into all different parts of the value chain from, you know, the archival in terms of discoverability of content into the simple production. So automation and programmatic uh, content automation. And it's, you know, all the things like highlights, goals, uh, player highlights, um, but I mean, even, even things like the ability to do A-B testing and multivariate testing of content, instead of having to produce one piece of content, which cost us X amount of uh, you know, dollars to produce, we could produce four pieces of the same content automatically, and we can go and test those in real time uh, out into our audience. And so we can actually start to fine tune that content as well. But it goes all the way into more creative production. I mean, in the future, we're not quite there yet, but AI is already capable of doing it. You know, we could have AI writing articles, writing match write-ups and summaries of, of matches. Uh, we can have them doing match uh, predictions or even uh, generating auto automatically generating infographics, um, all the way through to demand forecasting. You know, for resources like, uh, are we expecting to have a high demand on this content based on historical uh, historical analysis? And then, of course, you know, personalization. So, I mean, AI is really starting to become a critical tool in every single um, part of the value chain of delivering um, content to our, to our fans. Yeah, exactly. I, I relate so much and, you know, taking the ability to create a lot of content. And then when, when you ask yourself, okay, what am I going to do with all this content? If you can also apply some kind of recommendation engine that it has integration with this AI that creates all this content. So it would also know where to direct different pieces of content to different fans um, these are exactly the things that we're looking into and we're already doing today to some extent. And I totally agree with you, like this is the future of, um, you know, personalizing content. And, you know, you touched on archive and the, like often when I talk to clubs, they say we, we don't have rights. But then when we dig a little bit deeper, so we find out they have rights for content, they just don't know how to utilize. So I, I tell them, look, you have a great international and loyal fan base you have this amazing brand, you have your own and operated platforms, and you also have a lot of content that you're just not using. It's archive content. Mm -hmm. And, you know, according to PW, PwC, for example, uh, from last year's survey, they said the top sports properties utilize less than 5% of their archive content. Eventually, what we did at WSC, we enabled rights holders, especially clubs with a lot of archive that they don't use, to index and analyze all their archive repository automatically and you know, just provide them with very efficient tools to get much more value out of their archive content, whether it's just for content production or also to you know, monetize it and uh, increase fan engagement through it. What are your plans with regards to archive content? And maybe afterwards we can actually uh, show the people what we're doing today around archive. Sure, I mean, archive, archive is like, it's sort of a treasure chest, right? Because I mean, it really represents everything that's happened until now. So, I mean, the richness of the stories that are embedded in that archive content is incredible. And the biggest problem really, and I mean, it's not, I mean, we've had tools to be able to, to tag and categorize our archive content for some time. That's not necessarily new, but the new aspect of it is a much 
more, uh, how would you say, I mean, it's a more intelligent way of understanding that content. With the newer approaches with uh, you're leveraging deep learning like you're, like you're doing with WSC, um, you're really getting a lot of that, um, that nuance out of the content. So, you know, we've had AI tools for some time that can do basic object recognition, but it's not really that interesting to us to know that there's a football in the video. What we really want to know is we want to know who the, which player is in that. And that's a difficult topic in its own right, because you've got, you know, you can't do it necessarily based on facial recognition because they may have their back to it. You can't do it on the number of the shirt because there's different periods in history that have, uh, you know, different players wearing the same number. So there's so much contextual information and being able to extract all the meaning out of that archive and being able to access it very quickly is opening up a whole new world of opportunities for generating really engaging content. And you can kind of think of it a bit like a, a time machine in a sense, because when we look at our entire fan base, our fan base spans multiple generations. We've got super young fans that are just now discovering Real Madrid, uh, maybe through their family or maybe through content that we're producing. And then you've got, you know, older generations of fans that have been following the club for uh, perhaps 90 years. And so throughout all those generations, there's been amazing moments that each generation is going to resonate more with. And all those moments are tied up in that archive. So being able to bring all of that archive back to life in a way that's very efficient uh, and leveraging all the nuance and all the context that surrounds all the, the metadata that's, that's inside the archive is really, really critical and will be a, an, an enormous uh, asset of, uh, for value for creating uh, content moving forward. Yeah, and you mentioned Time Machine. We actually call our archive project DeLorean because uh, it is, it is a time machine. And, uh, and, and yeah, like I totally agree with everything you said and also the ability to take automatically all this archive content that you produced and, and kind of connect it contextually to the present. So for example, if it's Raul's birthday today or Roberto Carlos or whatever, so you know the machine can do it for you today. It can recognize that this is the right date, create the right content package with all the contextual graphics and put it out there. So eventually it's not just about creating content and distributing it randomly, but it also connecting it con contextually to, you know, to the date or to the teams you're playing against or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. And maybe we can even show a very quick demo. Guys, can you play the video that we sent you? Yeah. So what you see here, guys, is uh, one of our systems that basically enables you to create content instantly based on the action team, um, a game or a player. In this case, we're creating a Benzema highlight. There are a lot of actions that we can filter by automatically because the, the, the system actually analyzes all of them, but let's choose just goals. From all the last six seasons, we're currently analyzing 20 seasons. This is just an example from the last six. Also, let's say you want to put it in a one-by-one -one aspect ratio in Facebook. Uh, we're, we actually have a special algorithm that crops it automatically perfectly by tracking not just from the center, but the point of interest. And we're now uh, also adding to it a contextual graphic. And this is how this video would look like with this five seconds of work. You will get this automated video of Karim Benzema with a, a, an automated intro of top five goals of Karim Benzema with the right template and everything. With this graphic overlays of the countdown of the top five plays because that's what we want to do. With the, the metadata of the date, who we played against, etc with the automated um, cropping of the video, with the celebrations, the replays and everything. Guys, I think we can stop the video now. But basically that was the, one of the main things that we wanted to do together, the ability to just analyze all your content that just laying there and being able to produce this kind of videos with the click of a button, you know, just like that, best goals of Karim Benzema from the last six seasons. And as you said, not just uh, recognizing that was a goal, that was the ball, but also who's the player, how fascinating it was. We're giving this automated rating to each play, enabling you to also kind of filter what's more relevant, what's more or less important. Um, and I mean, there's so much to come and I hope that in the very near future, we'll be able to show very cool things together around Archive. Yeah, that, that was a great demo. Thanks for that, Itai. 
I mean, it's, uh, I, I think that we're gonna continue to see more and more development in that area as, as the AI continues to advance. I mean, I, with the amount, of, the amount of content and the amount of data that we've got available to work with, um, I really can only see the AI algorithms improving. And I mean, we, if, if for anyone that sort of tracks the, the AI uh, sort of development in the industry, um, the, uh, I mean, the work that's being done at the very, very bleeding edge uh, with these massive, massive data sets start to, to give a, a, an idea of where AI is going. So, I mean, in terms of the, the level of the sort of human level of um, creativity that can be even uh, created through it. So I'm really excited to see where these algorithms are going to continue to advance to. And, and uh, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons we wanted to work with you, Itai, was so that we can start to explore that further and, and see where we can push the limits. Right. Um, yeah. And we're very excited about it. Um, maybe I will ask one last question. So we'll have enough time for uh, the people to ask their, their own. Um, something that I was interested personally, we talked about what kind of content is more engaging. We talked about building a very strong brand around content. I think one of the fascinating phenomena that we see around the world, maybe especially in the US, but also in Europe to some extent, the player versus the team. So it seems like sometimes the individual player's brand is even more stronger and more popular than you know the team themselves. Um, like, what do you think about this trend? Do you think it conflicts with the club's interest and KPIs and objectives to build their brand or the clubs can leverage these popular you know, superstars? Well, I think like anything, there's, um, you know, we live in a, in a complex ecosystem. And, and I think that naturally what's happened because of the development of, you know, social networks like, uh, like TikTok and Instagram, which have become more individually centered. So we're seeing this emergence of sort of super celebrities and your traditional celebrities are obviously very, very big on these platforms, but you're seeing the emergence of, of new, you know, YouTube stars, TikTok stars, and there is this natural progression towards wanting to be able to more directly engage with your, your heroes, your celebrities. And so naturally in the sports sector, I think we're seeing the same sort of trends emerge. You know, fans always want to connect with their favorite players. And so social media is allowing them to do that. And so we, we're certainly not going to try and fight against massive trends. And, and, and if anything, what it does is, is as the players are growing their profiles, it's obviously also bringing a lot of um, a, a lot of interest to the club. Now, in saying that, you know, you can't have one without the other. Uh, you can't have players without the club, and you can't have club without the players. And so that's really where I see it being more of a of an ecosystem uh, where one supports the other. If if the the trend were to continue to the very extreme. Uh, it could potentially be uh, damaging in some ways for the for the club uh, social channels, and that's why uh, a re already a lot of sports teams are, are realizing that it may require a slight shift in the way that we think about these relationships. And so, a more symbiotic relationship between player and club uh, may need to be uh, you know put more weight on in, in the future as we go. And so, we we perhaps look at creating more of a uh, a direct working relationship. Uh, from us, from a media and social media standpoint, where one, uh, where the individual brand supports the club brand and the club brand supports the individual brand, and I think that's something that we'll start to see a little bit of a shift in the way those relationships are managed moving forward. But uh, I mean, I, I I think that it's only going to continue to grow collectively in terms of uh, we're going to see more and more following on these different platforms because. Um, it's just the natural progression of things, but but the relationship between them may change over time. Yeah, I think this relationship is fascinating. When you see, you know, the trends of social engagement after Messi left Barca to Paris or now Ronaldo from Juve to Man United back. So sometimes when you read like the, the press, the media coverage of, of these, um, you know, movements, they talk more about, the change in social engagement and new followers rather than how it's going to impact, you know, the team from the sports perspective. And it seems like it's also as important or as, uh, as interesting as, as the game itself. And uh, yeah, I'm just very curious to see how, how it's going to play out in the future um, with, with, you know, these kind of trends. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I think we have like five minutes. Um, Marta, do we have any questions from the crowd?
Okay, so actually she sent me a question here. Uh, one of the questions is, um, is Real Madrid planning to do anything in the NFT or crypto space? And how AI companies like um, WC or any other company can support this effort, if at all? That's a, that's a great question. No, the, um, the NFT space and the, and the token space is obviously a, a, a massive, massive uh, growing opportunity. Um, NFT is absolutely going to be fundamental to, to fan engagement. Um, and I think the, I'm going to give my honest answer, which is that I don't think anyone exactly knows what it's going to look like in the future. Um, but what I do, what I would say is it's going to be important. Uh, we live in a progressively more and more, more and more of a digital world, more and more of an online world. Uh, people, younger, younger fans in particular, are spending more and more of their time in online environments. So the, the rise of NFTs is very natural. Uh, we're going to need digital things to live in digital worlds, and those digital things are going to have value. So NFTs is an incredible opportunity, and it's going to be very, very important to the sports sector. Uh, we absolutely uh, have plans around it. Unfortunately, I can't really talk specifically about what those plans are at the moment. Sure. The way it was, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Uh, I can't talk specifically about um, those those plans, but yes, I mean NFTs are. Uh, we see it as a critical part of our of our fan engagement, our digital strategy moving forward. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I know we, we texted a little bit about it a few months ago. Um, yeah. Like I just answered the second part of the question. Uh, I, I can, I can share the WC is also engaging in the space. And I think that if we're talking about um, us helping rights holders with creating more content and basically eliminating the, the content creation as a bottleneck and in order to create NFTs, you need content, especially unique content, uh, special content, whether it's, uh, it relates to archive or to any other thing, it relates to contextual graphics, it relates to special um, effects and filters that you want to put on top of the content, um, and understanding what content is more interesting or less interesting according to some kind of uh, criteria and the rating that we give. So we're engaging today with a lot of, um, whether it's uh, NFT um, uh, marketplaces or rights holders in order to help to uh, create and promote this uh, um, kind of I would say effort. And also we even uh, explore currently the ability to bid on NFTs live during the game. So Michael, like imagine that something is happening now, a goal just happened. Instead of placing a bet, you can bid on a real time rendered NFT from the goal that just happened 30 seconds ago during the game. So it's kind of another fan engagement experience live during the game that should help rights holders to keep fans engaged during the live stream. Um, so these are all things that we're also looking into these days. Uh, definitely a fascinating world, the crypto NFTs. Um, yeah, 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 and I'm also looking forward to see what you're going to do. Absolutely. And, and I think that those sorts of experiences, being able to create real-time engagement in real time that are being driven by these new technologies like blockchain, the ability to settle these transactions instantaneously, uh, without having you know, a centralized uh, party in the middle, it really opens up a whole new range of, of ways to engage fans that are more in line with, you know, I think we're going to see crossovers between everything from sort of sports betting to fantasy to uh, you know, gamification and, and the ability to sort of participate in these things that have real benefits back to the fans. That's what I think one of the things that we're seeing the most now is that fans are, are really able to extract new value that they couldn't ever get before through their direct participation at a global level. And that, that's really game changing once those sorts of mechanisms start to start to mature and start to, to find their way into the market. So I think being a fan is gonna be far more interactive in the future than it's ever been. And it's gonna be a far more valuable experience from a fan's perspective as well through these new technologies. Yeah, totally agree. I actually wanted to ask you what's gonna be the next thing, but I, I think that you, you just answered that. Um, is there anything else you want to add on, you know, the general topic, like uh, the role of AI in media production or content strategy in general in the 40 seconds we have, or uh, you're good? No, I mean, uh, I, you put me on the spot there, but no, I mean, other than to say that, uh, that, like I said before, I mean, AI is often used as a buzz, buzzword, but I mean, it's, it's really, at a, we're at a moment, or maybe we're even past that moment, but we're at a moment where AI is going to be so critical 
in every single aspect of everything we do. And I mean, I'm not just talking about media, but I'm talking about across the whole business. And so, um, you know, for, I guess for anyone that's out there that's still sort of thinking about, you know, do we need to be investing into this area? I mean, I think the answer is wholeheartedly yes. I mean, it's, it's something that you need to be doing now to be competitive uh, in the future. So, um, so I don't know, I think we might be, I think that might be uh, it for, for time, but, um, but for, my, for my part, thank you very much for the conversation. It's been very enjoyable. Yeah, thanks so much, Michael. I enjoyed it very much. And I can say that from my personal uh, perspective, uh, it's a like, great honor to collaborate with someone like you with uh, this kind of innovative vision. Um, and uh, I think that people like you will lead the industry and uh, it's a great privilege to be a part of it. So thank you. And uh, yeah, talk soon. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you. Ita. Did you see these highlights? And all of those? And that one? These videos were created by WSC Sports AI Automation.